there. Okay, so now I've done all of the housekeeping that I'm supposed to do. Um, I hope you are all getting your newsletters. If you are not getting your newsletters and your emails, please let us know because we clean it up and we make this happen. But if we don't know that, uh, that you're not getting them, then we can't do that. So I'm relying on you to make sure that you let us know. And we hope that you are following what you what we are offering you both in person and Zoom. Um, and um, tomorrow night, Shelly will be doing a really lovely Japanese movie like Father, Like Son. And um, The New Yorker is Thursday nights and it goes on and on and on. And, and remember, Bacha will be with us next week. It's not the usual every two weeks. So watch your calendar and make sure that you join her again and you'll learn about the rest of the month at that time. So without further ado, Bacha, take it away and tell us all about Whistler. Sure. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you to the friends of the Sterling Road Library. It is always my pleasure to teach a lecture. And today we're going to learn about one of my favorites. And I always say that every time I am teaching about somebody because I fall in love every time I, I have to do the research for a class. And Whistler is really an amazing artist. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Let me just, just go ahead and do this. And we're going to start with the class. So Whistler. Whistler probably today is not as well known as he was in his lifetime. In his lifetime, he was very successful, very controversial. <laughs> he had a trial. He is going to be very prolific. And he is born, first of all, he's part of that Gilded Age artist, um, you know, society at that time but very often we forget that he was an American who lived in the UK and also in Paris and he's known for his poetic titles as we're gonna see he was uh named the whole name his complete name is James Abbott McNeil Whistler at some point he's going to adopt his mother's last name so he's known as James McNeil Whistler very often we see that uh, when we learn about him. And um, we are going to see how he changes and how he's going to progress. Because in his art, we see that he was against any sentimentality, any frivolity, and any moral allusion in painting. Because until this time, and we're talking about in the middle of the 19th century, we're looking at paintings that are related to symbolism, that are related to religion to um, mythological topics and stuff like that. But he's against all that. And this was part of the philosophical idea that was going on. And he's one of the leading proponents of art for art's sake, even though he did not coin that phrase, but he's known for that because actually he's based on a artist, uh, I'm sorry, a writer and philosopher, Gautier, a French uh, philosopher who coined the term art for art's sake. And Gautier is going to um, write first a novel, and then he's going to write more about it. Other artists or other poets are going to be uh, writing about it. So for him, as with Gautier and other writers, there is a parallel um, development between painting and music. There is a communication, or there is a, a um, collaboration between painting and music. So he's going to change at some points in his career, all of his titles into titles that have to do with music. Because for him, he's going to uh, uh, re or, um, or represent that music or that arrangements or harmonies or nocturnes. And for him, the total uh, harmony is very important. That's why he's going to see in his landscapes, colors that are the basic idea of his concept. So he was born in, in 1834 in Lowell, Massachusetts. And he is going to have his father who was a railroad engineer. And he is the first son of George Washington Whistler. Look at the name, very interesting. This is a portrait of his father by another artist. So his father is going to work 
uh, as a railroad engineer. His mother, Anna Matilda McNeil, is his second wife. Now, the first wife, he was a widow, and he has a second wife. We're going to talk about her, of course. So they're going to uh, live in Lowell until he was three years old. Today, his house where he lived is a museum, a small museum, doesn't have a lot. But on this, unless you're really very interested in where he lived when he was a small baby, then you should go to his house in Lowell. His father had a, a job and, and, and in Stonington, so they moved to Connecticut, to this place, and he's going to work, his father, at the railroad in Stonington. He has an older half-sister and a half-brother from his other, um, his other wife. And he had also three sisters that died in infancy. So we have that he also had a younger brother who survived, which we see here in this small painting that they did of the two boys. And again, his father is going to become uh, a very good engineer. So he's going to be the chief engineer for the Boston and Albany the Railroad. So they, have, they are financially better. And they're going to move to Springfield in Massachusetts. There they're going to have a mansion. So the house is larger. The mansion is in the corner of Chestnut and Edward Streets in Springfield. Today, that is another museum, not about Whistler. It's the Wood Museum of History, which we see right here. But it was where his house was when they lived in Springfield. But everything changes when the Tsar Nicholas I of Russia is going to offer George Whistler a position of engineering, of course, to develop a railroad from St. Petersburg to Moscow. And the whole family moves, moves to St. Petersburg in Russia. That is a completely different move. His father is going to design the railroad bridge from the that crosses over the Masta River. And this is a photograph of that bridge designed by his father. So he learned Russian, of course, while being there. He learned French as well, but he was a very moody child. He was ill very often. He was... Uh, very temperamental, and his parents didn't know what to do with him until they discovered that he loved drawing. And while he was drawing, he would settle down so he would be a little more tranquil. This is one of his notebooks when he was a young boy. And he has talent, of course, to draw. They see that. So what their parents are going to do, they're going to give him private lessons. When he's 11 years old, he's going to be enrolled in the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts in Russia. And they are gonna teach him the traditional curriculum of drawing, of looking at masterpieces, of also sculpting from plaster cast. And very occasionally they would have live models. He's going to have also an important meeting with an artist, Sir William Allen. He was in Russia at the same time and he was commissioned to paint a his the history of the life of Peter the Great in Russia. That's why he was in Russia and when he meets him, he's going to um, have some lessons by him. He was a good student in anatomy. And Whistler's mother, we have her diary. And she's going to write that the great artist remarked to me, and he's talking, she's talking about Sir William Allen. That the little boy was has a common genius, but do not urge him beyond his inclination. He was 10 years old when uh, they write about him. On the other hand, uh, he spent some time in London. He would travel to London because he had some relatives there. His father would stay in Russia while they travel. And he's going to meet also George Whistler's brother-in-law, Francis Hayden. He was an artist as well. He was a doctor. And he's going to encourage that the child would uh, develop a talent in art because he was good, because he knew uh, and he saw the drawings that Whistler was doing. He would encourage him to visit the art collections. He encouraged him also to listen to lectures of art. And he is the first one. He gives him a watercolor set that sets him off to do watercolors at the beginning. This is a portrait of his, by the way, by Sir William Boxall. He began to be very interested in art. He collects art books. He studied the uh, techniques that the artists were doing. And he said of this portrait, this is really very nice uh, because he said, when he saw himself as a 15 year old boy. He's very much like me and very fine. This is a very fine picture. Mixed Boxal is a beautiful colorist. It is a beautiful creamy surface and looks so rich. So he was observing how 
this in this painting, he was portrayed. But he sends a letter to his father because he wants to become a painter. And he writes, I hope, dear father, you will not object to my choice. That is to say, of course, a painter. For I wish to be one so very much, and I don't see why I should not. Many others have done so before. Of course, his father didn't want that, or his mother. But at 49 years old, his father dies from cholera. So they're going to move back to Pomfret, Connecticut, which was the hometown of his mother. She didn't know what to do. Actually, uh, they didn't have a lot of income and there was an uncertain future for the family, but she had to carry out uh, what was to be done. So she's gonna send him, Whistler, to the Christ Church Hall School because she wants him to become a minister. That would be a good career for the young man. <clears throat> Always had a sketchbook with him. He makes a lot of caricatures and he loves drawing. So he does that very often. And instead of being a minister, he's gonna be accepted at West Point. He goes to the military academy. He has a good family name, so he is accepted. He did not, not have good health. He was ill very, very often. But he spent three years at the acad academy at West Point and he did not do very well because he didn't like authority at all. And he would always have this kind of a sarcastic humor and he would just spill it out and say some very sarcastic comments. His caricatures are, uh, they show this kind of, of, of humor that he had. And this is one of his drawings while he was at West Point and it's called Position of a Soldier. And look at uh, how he makes fun of it, of course. And then he puts the title again, Annihilation of the Bowels. This is how you have to be very straight and just uh, press everything. So he has a bit, very, very humorous, kind of sarcastic humor uh, that he also um, does in his drawings. While he was, there's a story that while he was doing this chemistry ex exam, he was asked to describe silicon. And he said, silicon is a gas. Of course, he was making fun of the teacher. And later he's going to comment about it. He says, if silicon was a gas, I would have been a general one day, making fun, of course, of that. But they did not like his humor at all. He was dismissed because of his misconduct. Robert, uh, the Colonel, Colonel Robert E. Lee was the superintendent at the time. And of course, he did not accept that. So at that time, he's going to have to earn a living. And he, uh, he knew how to draw, but he ha had to learn more. And he's going to learn how to make maps. Robert W. Weir is the instructor at the academy who is going to um, educate him on, on how to draw maps. And this is a painting by him, by Weir. And this is one of those drawings made by Whistler. He's gonna work as a draftman and he's gonna map the US coast. For him, this was very boring, very boring. And he would go and play billiards when he was free. He was always broke because he spent all of his money. And very often what we see in his drawings are other drawings that he makes, sometimes mermaids or sea serpents. In this case, we have lots of figures right here and on the other side of different people. But instead of just focusing on the, on the coastal landscape that we're seeing here, but he also would make a lot of sketches that were used. But in 1855, a relative of him, uh, Thomas Winans, he's gonna give him some money to help him to travel to Paris. He's going to settle in Paris at the Latin Quarter where there was this kind of bohemian life and he would enjoy that very much. He had even a girlfriend right from the start. She was a dressmaker that her name was Eloise while he was in Paris. And he's going to study at the workshop, this atelier of Glare. By the way, this is the same atelier that were later we're going to have um, Monet and also Sisley and others uh, join in this. But at that time, they of course, they are not here. This is very early uh, in time. And Glare was an admirer of Ang. This is one painting by Dominique Ang, uh, the very famous Roger Fring Angelica. And we see the interpretation of Whistler, of just the detail of Angelica. So for Glare and also, and we're gonna see how this progresses, 
in the in the work by Whistler at this time, line is more important than color. But this is going to change for Whistler because color is going to become more important than line or drawing. And black for artists like Lear or by, or by, for uh, Dominic Ang, black is, is very important because it gives you, first of all, the outline, but it gives you the tonal harmony of the work. This is going to change when the impression is later on because they do not use this kind of representation or those kind of muted colors that people were used to this. So on the left, you have, a, a, I would say, an exercise of one of the paintings that he's copying at the loop uh, that we see from Ang on the right-hand side. In 1858, um, he's going to be with Ernest Delanoy and he's gonna travel with him through France and through the Rhineland. He was an, an artist and he starts making engravings. This is called the French set. And we have the um, representation of something that he's looking at. He's not um, imagining anything. He's not creating something new. But when you see an engraving, it gives you a lot of publicity. It gives you name. People begin to know about you. They people uh, see your drawing, that you are talented. And this is the beginning of his career. Here we have the town of Leverdon, and here we have his interpretation. Of course, this is a, a photograph of today's today how it, the town looks like. But this is another uh, of those engravings or etching, actually, the this uh, um, store and the everyday life that it is portrayed by Wester at this point. People on the streets that he is uh, encountering, that he's interested in representing, and he does them in a very wood, good way. So we have a lot of etchings from this French set. He will go back to etching later on, but this is his first portrait. It's very dark, it's very, he uses a very thick pigment, and it looks like a Rembrandt because he was an admirer of Rembrandt. On the left-hand side, you see a Rembrandt, an actual Rembrandt of this many self-portraits of Rembrandt made of himself. But he looks at himself, Whistler, and he wants, of course, to be like Rembrandt. He's going to do that later on in his career, 1872. This is another of his self-portraits. And we can compare it to the Rembrandt on the right-hand side. Very muted palette, palette that he uses. The, um, the division in the background, in, in case um, you see the right-hand side of Rembrandt, he uses what is called a parapet, which is going to divide the space from the, um, the, the the sitter itself and the viewer on the other side, which are, is us. As I mentioned at the beginning of the class, Gautier is gonna write a lot about art for art's sake. And he is going to explore the similar qualities between art and music. This inspired Whistler to view art in musical terms. That is why we're gonna see how he changes dramatically. He was painting very realistic, objects and subjects. So he's going to exhibit his work. He exhibited his work. And in 1859, he goes to London. He would visit France very often. So he will come back and forth. This is what he was doing at the time, very realistic representation of an old lady. And then he's, when he settles in, in London, he's going to go with his, to live with his half-sister, Deborah, and her husband, Dr. Francis Seymour Hayden. He was a doctor but he was also an amateur etcher. And he's going to teach him more about this technique. This is a self-portrait of uh, Dr. Francis Seymour Hayden. And he was really a good amateur etcher and a good artist, although he of course was a physician. So he wanted to promote his work. He does another set of etchings. He will go back, as I said, very often to this kind of technique. And this is, uh, when we think about etching, this is the first time that an artist has, they have the tools to do their own work, to control it. So here we have another set of etchings that is called the Thames uh, set etchings. It's also a series of them. But his paintings have this quality of tranquility. He represents his half sister and her daughter in the music room. In, while he is in London, she's playing the piano, but it's an unsentimental kind of work. We don't see 
that there is a lot of expression, but there is a contrast between the black dress of the sister and her daughter in white. This was displayed and shown at the Royal Academy in London. And uh, we have that the structure of it is very balanced. There is a division of the two frames right here on the top and the piano, of course, from one side to the other and from the child who's looking at her mother while she is playing the piano. If we compare it to this one, it's the same room, although it has a different angle, it's called the music room. And later this same painting, which is called the music room, he's going to retitle it and he's going to call it Harmony in Green and Rose. So the color becomes much more important than what he is representing. It is a genre scene, of course, the girl is reading a book, the, uh, the, his half sister is uh, just standing on one side. The whole decoration of the room is full of a floral fabric. And for him, he had a very, very strict routine. He would start very quickly, then he would adjust parts of the composition, then he would just leave that alone, and then he would come back and finish the painting. That, that was his routine, that's how he would do it. So we have the same um, um, pers uh, persons right here, the same figures, but in a different setting, different angle, and a different kind of composition. We also see that he's uh, rather influenced or, uh, or he sees the early impressionistic work, uh, although he does not adopt that kind of representation. But he uses the first idea of what color means for him. And this is the beginning of what he's going to call the tonal harmony. But the palette is very determined. You don't have bright colors or contrasting colors anymore. We see him uh, exploring different things and different topics. He's going to meet Johanna Hiffernan. Johanna is gonna be his mistress. He, she was very, very smart, so she's going to become his business manager. And uh, he's going, she's going to be his muse, his model in very, very, in many of his paintings. This is Symphony in White number one, also called the White Girl. So when we see this, it's more about the color, white. It is a portrait, of course. She's standing on, on, that, uh, on that room. But on the other hand, it's a study of the color white. We see also some of the details because even though Whistler is going to deny the connection uh, with literature, that there was very often the pre-Raphaelists did, did that and uh, they thought it was part of this. Um, of, let me just go back a little bit so you can see the whole thing. Because there was um, a book, a novel actually, The Woman in White, and people thought that he was inspired by the book but instead of that, he says, there's nothing to do with the book. I did not uh, care for that. Actually, for me, it's just about a portrait in white. But of course, it was a lot of, there was a lot of noise about it. And even though he did not, he did not care about it, but he benefited from the publicity. So what is he representing here? There was an interpretation that probably the painting, because it's white, it was representing the purity or on the contrary, free love. But for him, this is a study in white. He, we have some symbols like this orange blossom that probably refers to purity and the symbol of marriage because in many occasions we have books that are explaining all of those symbols from the Middle Ages onwards. And very often we see that artists would go to those kind of guides to, to make a reference. On the other hand, we see that she's standing on top of this uh, bare skin rug, which is also interpreted as masculinity and an aggressive male loss, and she's on top of it. So also all those kinds of interpretations, he never cared to explain. But this painting, even though he uh, presented it to the Royal Ac Academy exhibition, it was rejected. And he's going to show it in a private gallery. We could compare this painting of uh, by Gustav Klimt of Serena Lederer, who is also exploring color in this case. Or the, the way that people had a portrait, it was very different because 
it is um, the representation of somebody who has this kind of dress that is very free or very loose in comparison to the other one in the left, which are using, she's using this, this lady is using a corset, very extravagant or elegant kind of dress. In the case of Whistler, we have a very simple gown and probably was designed by Whistler himself and Joanna Hiffernan. But this one was also shown in Paris at the Salon of the Rejected One, the Salon des Refuses. If also at this point, he's going to meet Dante Gabriel Rossetti. He was one of the members of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And both of them, and this is a painting by him, uh, both of them enjoyed and they were fascinated with uh, the, the dress that was very loose and also with red hair uh, women. So they share that. And here we have Joanna also with this glorious, gorgeous uh, hair that she had as well. Later, he was a good friend of another uh, artist, uh, a French artist, Henri Fantin, Fantin Latour. And he's going to tell him, Wizard's going to tell him that the little girl was produced by a rascal puffed up and pride at showing off his splendid gifts to other painters. Very often at the beginning of a career, an artist wants to show them how he can paint and how he can, can, he can display his talents. This is the same time that Manet produced this very famous Le Déjeuner sur Lèvres, 1863, which was rejected in France. And the one by Whistler was accepted to be shown at the Salon. He is inspired by what we call Japanism, also in France would say chinoiserie, which were all of the things that came from Asia. And here we have Joanna, Joanna Hivernan, posing for him with, of course, uh, things that came from the uh, Far East. She is posing in this three quarters angle. She is relaxing her arm on top of the fireplace. She's wearing a, a little more conventional kind of dress with this bell-shaped crinoline in, that it was in fashion. But look how we find here some objects that are uh, Asian, like this vase and this fan. And actually, there were things that he owned. It was part of his own collection. This is one of those catalogs that became very important for people in, in London, especially, but also in France, because they begin to have trade with the Middle East, and they begin to have collections that are related to that kind of, of, of object that were very uh, exotic for them. This, as we find here in the back, we see, of course, the, the Chinese porcelain, but also in the back, we see one of his paintings. And probably it's this one that we have here that is already uh, using those same tones, brown and silver. Of course, it's the old Battersea Bridge, but the uh, importance of color, the tonal uh, importance. And also this fan, that is a woodcut of Hiroshige, and it also uh, made, uh, I'm sorry, uh, inspired this this uh, this part of it, of, of this object, because it was part of his collection, as I mentioned. His friend uh, Swinburne, who was a poet, an English poet, is going to uh, write a poem of the little, the, the little white girl, and the title is gonna be Before the Mirror. You can look, look it up, it's right here. But uh, what happened is that we find that there is this um, argument, what comes first, literature or a painting, or a painting that depends on, on literature. And this was the other way around. Although people thought that it was uh, Whistler who was inspired by the poem. But of course, it was not. It was the other way around. So um, Whistler is going to write to the newspaper to refute this rumor, and he says those lines were only written afterwards. Actually, in my studio, I had already done this painting, and then we have that his own friend Fairburn is going to repay the compliment, and he said, "Whatever merit my song may have, it is not so complete in beauty." in tenderness and significance, in exquisite ex execution and delicate strength as Whistler's picture. So of course, 
they were good friends. He's going to, again, uh, we're talking about art for art's sake because it's part of his philosophy. And Swinburne, who was this poet, he pioneered also the idea. And he's also writing a critical essay about William Blake. And he talks about art for art's sake. So it was a whole ambience of this moment that art is by itself. Uh, it doesn't need anything else. The title of the little white girl is going to be changed into Symphony in White Number no. Two. Again, that idea of music and musical th topics or musical themes, the composition is the central thing, but not the subject matters, but what we're looking at with respect of color and the rhythm that we find in a composition. Other things that we find in this painting are objects like this ring, which is the focal point. And if, when we see a ring like that, we have the image of a married woman that wears the ring on her finger, but the, uh, Joanna and Winston were not married, they were, they were lovers. And in this case, he's portraying her as a married woman, as we're going to see in a different way how she's going to be portrayed. Because in this case, um, according to Winston, by the way, She's portrayed as a prostitute here. She is besides the river wharf and she is um, besides one of his friends, the artist Alphonse de Gros. And the background is very well detailed with all of those uh, ships right there. And she's very relaxed. The figure in the, in the foreground is kind of blurry. So it's the other way around. It's not like we actually look when something is near, we see that it is very clear. In the background, it's, it is a little bit more blurry. So he is going to portray her as a prostitute, as a, this allegory of purity, as a married woman. She is going to be his muse for this time at this moment. She was uh, very young when they met. She was 17 years old when she came uh, from Ireland. She had beautiful, gorgeous hair, very, very expressive eyes. And these are description, descriptions of her. Her, what, her sense of style was wonderful. She was very lively and very intelligent. So uh, it was, of course, uh, the perfect couple. And we have a whole history, of course, of this painting until it was transferred to the Tate Gallery where it is today. But he kept on doing this kind of paintings that are inspired by uh, Asian things. They were called Japanese things, but uh, they, as a whole, they were uh, Asians from different places. And it was a personal collection that he used in many occasions, uh, even ceramics, uh, porcelain, embroidered uh, robes that we see right here. This is uh, purple and rose. And the title of this one is not only purple and rose, but it's the large lesson of the six marks. Why is that? Because of the porcelain. It's 17th century Chinese porcelain jar, Langlaisen, which is a Dutch phrase that seems to, to, to mean decorated with elongated figures, as we see here. Also, part of the title is the mark, the six marks that are the potter's marks on the bottom of the jar. And actually, uh, Wester is going to carve the potter's mark on the gilded frame uh, that he made as well on this painting. On January 1864, his mother arrived in London. His mother was very strict. She was very religious. She was, she was Protestant. Joanna is living with, with him at this point, but there's family tensions and Whistler is going to write with, to his friend, uh, Henri Fantin Latour. It was general upheaval. I had to empty my house and purify it from cellar to eaves, meaning that uh, Hifernand was out of the picture because of his mother. His paintings are very romantic during this period. She is uh, portrayed right here uh, with another girl, uh, relaxed, but also everything is white, symphony in white number three. As you see this one, which really uh, I love. I think it's very, very beautiful, this painting, and very well balanced with all of those colors. But he also introduces here one of those uh, objects, those Asian uh, fans or Japanese fans that he collected. 
he travels to Chile, to Valparaíso, and he said that he was going to be there and he wanted to go there for political reasons. Chile was at war with Spain and also the underdog, a uh, small nation trying to uh, fight a larger one, which was Spain. So he paints while he's there. We are not sure what really uh, drove him to go there, but he travels to Chile, to Valparaíso, and he stays there for a few months. He's going to produce some of the first night scenes. Then he's going to name them Moonlights, and then he's going to into nocturnes. Remember the musicality of his topics or his titles, at, at least. This is the harbor. He uses the uh, beautiful blurry image with blue and, and light green as, as the tonal um, atmosphere of this place. And this is Valparaiso Bay. <clears throat> While he is away, actually, Wister and, 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 and a quote, he lent Hifernan to Gustave Courbet, the artist who was also uh, very controversial and very political. And he is the uh, promoter of realism. And she is going to pose in this painting called Le Sommeil. It is said that uh, Cooper would sleep with all of his models and he slept with, with her also, with Joanna. This is the moment when they start to break apart and the relationship is going to be, uh, uh, actually, they, they, they separate. But while he was in Valparaíso in Chile, Joanna Hifernan is going to take care of, the, uh, of the, his financial affairs in London. He still is going to paint uh, Asian inspired topics that are reminiscent of Greece or a frieze uh, that you could find in a temple in Greece, but they are dressed with contemporary dress, uh, but also the beautiful colors. And this is harmony in flesh color and red. It's this, the, the titles are very poetic and I love the titles. He is going to have a son with a maid, Louisa Fanny Hanson, his name is Charles, and he, Fernand, actually took care of him. This is a drawing of his son. And we get to his first masterpiece when he returns to London. He's going to do, of course, nocturnes over the next 10 years. But this is called Black and Gold Falling Rocket. This is a view of the River Thames on the uh, Cremorne Gardens. There would be a lot of fireworks displayed in this area, and he loved this uh, effect of light. So what he did, he used very thin paint, very diluted paint as a ground for it, and then he just put the sparkles of color that they suggest the ships, the, the ships, the, the lights, the shoreline. So it is very similar and very much more simple as those prints, Japanese prints, the Ukiyo-e by Hiroshige and painters like that. When Ruskin, who was an art critic and writer, saw this painting and the price that he was asking for it, he's going to write, I have heard and seen much of Cockney impudence, he said, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. Of course, he was making fun of Wister's painting. And paintings like this is what sets him apart. When Fantin Latour saw this kind of paintings, he didn't understand what was happening with his friend. And he said that all of those works were really confounding and very surprising and rise. I don't understand anything there. It's bizarre how one changes. I don't recognize him anymore. He did not like them. And for me, these are beautiful. Uh, very poetic, dreamlike versions of a landscape that are very subtle and very calming. He would use uh, the very diluted base paint, usually gray, and then he would work on the floor so he wouldn't have any drip of the color because it was so diluted. And then he would just work on the color one on top of the other. Nocturne blue and gold. He is portraying the old Battersea Bridge and the, also the people as a silhouette. Even in the back, we have also the buildings as a silhouette. But if you see this one on the left-hand side, this is a woodcut, one of those Japanese prints by Okusai, which is very similar. This tonal effect using just one color, one tone, 
to um to represent an atmosphere and, and a harmony in uh the landscape so he doesn't use any bright colors he is trying to represent a feeling an expression and he loved the moment of dusk or dawn because this is when you get to see everything a little bit more hazy and blurry also of course in london the fog would add to this effect so what he is going to paint is this is this is the moment when darkness comes in or on the contrary when light starts to get out those moments when the whatever you are looking at it becomes blurry and you cannot distinguish any of the objects anymore it all becomes an atmosphere oscar wilde said that he was fascinated by the fog Mallarmé, the poet, the French poet, said that he aimed to paint not the thing, but the effect it produces. All of this <clears throat> is going to inspire him. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he makes a series of those nocturnes. They are dreamy, uh, they are hazy, those compositions of the river, they are suggestive of night, but at the same time, they are very passive and very tranquil. Those uh, images of silhouettes with a tonal um, harmony. This uh, would, he would memorize the scene. He was not painting outdoors like the impressionist. He would just see something, he would sketch, and then he would memorize a feeling, and he would be inspired by those Japanese prints. Many artists are going to collect those Japanese prints. So he uses very subtle colors, very, very limited, very restricted palette that he is going to use. Also, he's going to have a lot of commissions to do portraits. He's going to meet Frederick Leland. He's going to become his uh, patron. He was also uh, an amateur musician. He loves Chopin and also probably is one of the inspirations to do and or to use the musical um, titles. And he said, I say I can thank you too much for the name Nocturne as a title for my moonlights. You have no idea what an irritation it proved to the critics and consequent pleasure to me. Besides, it is really so charming and does so poetically say that all I want to say and no more than I wish. And this is a letter by Whistler to Leland at some point thanking him. <clears throat> 1870, we have the Franco-Prussian War. Artists from France are going to come to England. One of them is Pissarro, the other one is Monet. Stay, uh, Degas and Manet stayed in France and uh, many others, but these two come to London. They're going to be uh, making a different kind of art and he's going to be exposed to this new movement, the Impressionism. So he's going to actually drift away from the realism that Coubert was doing before the Impressionists. And in 1874, we have the first Impressionist exhibition in France at the, um, the studio of Nadar. Nadar was a very famous photographer. And actually, Edgar Degas is going to invite Whistler to exhibit with the Impressionists, but he did not want to be associated with them, and he does not exhibit any of his paintings. I'm sure that you have seen this painting. His mother is being portrayed right here. How this come about? This painting is called Arrangement in Gray and Black Number One. Usually we call it Whistler's Mother. But what we know, the story goes that uh, he had a model that was coming. She didn't come one day. So he suggested that his mother pose for him and he did the portrait. So first she was standing. And she was very tired. Of course, she is, was not as young. So he thought that it would be better that she would sit down. So it's very, very, uh, um, very harmonic in, in the tonality, the uh, way that he uses colors. Again, very limited palette. He is going to paint his portrait in profile. This is a photograph of her. So very much alike that what he's uh, painting. And she was in charge of everything that he needed in his house. Also, she was very conservative, very strict, as I mentioned. But on the other hand, because she was living with him, 
this gives him a lot of uh, respectability. And he, she would help him out with the uh, painter that wanted to pay, to uh, acquire his, his work. And the very, very serious expression is because she would not, she would ever open the mouth to smile or something because she had lost uh, some teeth. So that's why we have her like this. He designed the frame, very simple, uh, but the painting was pawn, pawn because he at some point he's bankrupt. So uh, Stefan Mallarmé uh, helped, well, actually helped him out, and he convinced the government to yeah. buy it. That's why today is uh, at the Museo d'Orsay, he's the first American painting that was bought by the state of France. This painting is very austere, very simple, the palette, as I mentioned, is very limited, and he was really um, trying to represent something that is beyond a portrait. There's no narrative, there's nothing right there. There is nothing uh, that it has any symbol or message in it. It's a very simple design, but it is very balanced of shapes. The curved line of her body as she's sitting down with the very, very um, rigid pose and the chair, of course, of this verticality as she is um, putting her feet on top of this small um, area in right this box. And it is balanced with the frame in the back and the curtain that cuts the image on the one side. So all of those structures of a painting, they're very important because it gives you a harmony that probably you don't get until you start to study it. And you see all of the balancing uh, lines that we find in this painting. The painting in the back is one of Wister's paintings that we have here in detail. And it is this uh, painting, which was one of the etchings that we find. Also look at how he uses this technique, kind of pointillism, just to put some brush strokes. And it gives you the texture of the fabric in the back with very simple lines, very simple technique that he was using at the time. And he also <clears throat> develops his own mark, his own signature, inspired by <clears throat> those Chinese pot pot potter's mark, with the detail is right here. He was interested, of course, in Asian art, and <clears throat> he studied those uh, potter's mark, as I mentioned. He had uh, a lot of them, and he is going to use uh, Sometimes he uses them as a, a prop, as we find here, his own collection of porcelain uh, in the back of this painting. Not only that, but also using the fans, the Japanese fans that he collected. In a self-portrait, we see that. <clears throat> so the air here is very, very simple, but at the same time, very puri uh, puritanical. <clears throat> he said that he practiced a natural religion, uh, but his mother was very religious. This uh, portrait was used as a poster for temperance, for the temperance movement at some point that uh, would uh, be part of the model. This is his signature and he develops his butterfly signature. It's going to be very famous. He's going to use this kind of a sign for uh, signing his paintings. But Whistler's mother is going to be used in many, many different ways. Like here we have how is, uh, of course, is, a, is, is the, uh, the, the comics of Donald Duck and Bullwinkle the Moose, but also for greeting cards, magazines, cartoon characters, etc. And the movie, uh, Mr. Bean, where I'm gonna put a clip on it. <laughs> well, probably you've seen that uh, scene. So the, that painting is going to be shown at the Chicago World's Fair. It has great success. People love it. And actually, that painting almost burned in a fire 
uh, board a train during shipping before this. But it survived, is being used many occasions. It has been accepted as a universal icon of motherhood. Here we have a US uh, postal po postage stamp that was using that image of uh, his mother, that portrait of his mother. He's gonna have his hair first solo shop show the same year as the um, Impressionist exhibition, by the way. Uh, so he was really um, criticized, of course, and uh, but at the same time, he had some kind of success. He is going to show his work at this time and also some of his etchings that he made uh, later on as this uh, Adam and Eve and all Ch Chelsea. This photograph shows you exactly what he was looking at. And it's called Adam and Eve because there is um, a pub that is called Adam and Eve, which you see right here on this photograph, and he's going to portray it as well. So that is why it's called like that. So it's interesting to see he is, uh, of course, a man who looks companionship, and he's going to meet Maud Franklin. She becomes his mistress. He's going to have uh, two daughters with her, Ion and Maud. He will have a, a painting of her. It's called Arrangement in White and Black, but it's Maud Franklin. She was also an artist, and he will have a photograph of her. I'm sorry, it's not very best. <clears throat> and he's going to have commissions to do portraits, like this full-length portrait of Leland and his wife, Frances. He will have a photograph, so the, the likeness of, of him uh, is very, very similar. He was very good portraitist, but when he painted Mrs. Frances Leland, this is more poetic. Symphony in flesh color and pink is not only a portrait, it is about the textures, the fabric, the study of color, the flowers that are reminiscent of a Japanese woodcut. And oh, not only that, but the whole balancing of this, um, of this composition, the use of just one uh, of color and different uh, tones of the same color, but it is a monochrome painting. Those flowers, are the inspiration from those Japanese ukiyo-e, the woodcuts that he used very often. He would have a photograph of Sarah Bernhardt and probably also showing the, the, uh, the fashion of flowers as the design of her dress. Sarah Bernhardt was a very well-known actress, especially working in France. Leland is going to be a very wealthy man, a ship owner, an art collector. This is a painting by one of the pre-Raphaelites, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And he had also a wonderful collection of uh, Japanese and Chinese porcelain. He is going to hire an architect, Thomas Jekyll, to design a room to display his collection. Uh, and he will have the... Uh, some of the items that were designed at that time. Jekyll designed not only the room, but also some of the objects that were uh, used, that were gonna be used at this, uh, in this room, like this sunflower andirons for the fireplace, which we're gonna see in detail. Jekyll is going to design it, but um, Lila is not going to like it at all. So he asked Whistler to harmonize the room. And he's going to create harmony in blue and gold. It's called the Peacock Room as well. It is a masterpiece of interior design, of interior decorative mural art, because it's a, 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 a complete work of art from the ceiling to the walls and everything surrounding it. But what happened is that Lila was traveling and Whistler is going to just let his imagination run wild. Well, when Leland comes back, he is really not happy of what happened. And he, because he painted over a 16th century Cordova leather wall coverings. And it, actually it was a historic piece and he just painted it over. He said, well, you know, I just painted it on. I went on without design or sketch, putting in every touch and such freedom. And the, uh, and the harmony in blue and gold developing, you know, I forgot everything in my joy of it. He just kept on going and painting the doors, the walls, 
and everything there. He actually breaks with French realism forever. And he was not really interested in any pre social preoccupation because at the same time we have Art Nouveau. Uh, William Morris was the proponent of uh, the total work of art and also the pre raphael who work with, uh, with Morris. So he does not want to be associated with this kind of style of the total work of art or uh, with Morris or even Art Nouveau. He is inspired by Japanese prints, as you saw the peacock, but he paints everything. There's a pattern of feathers all around, including that ceiling that he paints with so much uh, work, just as, as this rhythm around the walls, but also on the ceiling of those feathers of a peacock in an abstraction, of course, it is an abstract way of painting. Also here on the wall, you can see part of that leather where he painted over. So there are flowers, there are feathers, there are some butterflies all around, uh, but this is a, an inspiration of representing a total work of art with a Japanese style as it was ca called Japanism. The painting that he does for this room especially, he called it La Princesse du Pays de la Porcelain, the Princess of the Country of Porcelain. And he, as I mentioned, he's going to deny his connection with Art Nouveau. We find here this screen in the back, a Japanese screen, a fan in her hand. She's wearing this kind of kimono and a robe, also that came from the Far East. And he also is going to be inspired by those a representation that came from uh, from Asia. This uh, opening trade with Japan especially, but many other places and goods that were available in Europe for the first time. And this is a cover of a magazine in Paris that he actually uh, probably had. And Van Gogh is going to trace these, uh, the, 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 the drawing of this magazine, the cover, he's going to do his own interpretation. So many artists are going to be inspired by this, those woodcuts, those ukiyo-e as they are called, including Van Gogh and many other artists. So he's going to have his own interpretation using a model, of course, uh, not an Asian model, but a European model. He covers everything with peacocks. And Lila is really very, very angry. So he doesn't want to pay, but Whistler wants a payment of 2,000 uh, today, around 200 pounds. Uh, but so it was a lot of money. Leland was not expected. Uh, he did not expect, I'm sorry, to, uh, to have this so much work. He just wanted him to do something very simple. So Leland offers half of the amount. There's of course uh, a problem. Whistler finally agrees, but he's very angry. And he does a painting called Art and Money or the Story of the Room. And look at this peacock who is kind of fighting this stingy puff peacock on top of gold coins. So the artist is being kind of attacked. At the end, uh, this is going to be one of his masterpieces. This is a photograph of how it looked at the time. And finally, this paint, this um, room was bought by Charles Frank And since 1919, it's going to be uh, put on, on, until it was on display in 1923, but it's going to be put at the Freer Gallery in Washington. And today you can visit that wonderful work of art. But other artists have done their own interpretation. And uh, Mr. Waterstone did this, uh, recreation of this work and he is going to criticize of course and this idea of luxury and he's going to name his room filthy lucre money power and art the idea of this elegant chaos of melancholic decay and the relationship between artists and patrons whistler as you saw is an artist who is known to have a very long career at the end, he's going to be uh, bankrupt. He's going to be sued. Uh, they have uh, also a lot of arguments between him and Ruskin, and he's going to lose all of his money. He had a very successful career, but uh, and he was very, very well known, 
But at the same time, he is going to become very controversial. Uh, and very often he had arguments with other um, intellectuals of his time. So Whistler, I hope you have enjoyed today's class. Whistler is one of my favorite uh, artists of all time because of his poetic way of representing landscapes and nature. Thank you very much, everyone. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, just open your uh, microphone and go ahead. Thank you, everyone. Oh, <laughs> thank you. My 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 new look. Somebody was saying. <laughs> thank you. Uh, any questions, comments before we leave, Linda? Linda, no, go ahead. I just wanted to say I never knew that he was uh, born, or rather lived. I always thought he was born in England. There you go. Yeah, I didn't realize he was... that he was American. Yeah, he was American. He yeah, and then the thing that I wanted to ask you is the Chinese chop. Is that what influenced his his little insignia on the painting? Yes, it did. Uh, yeah. Definitely. He was looking, first of all, the uh, pot remarks that he saw, but also the uh, the also the the in in at least in some of the woodcuts, they use kind of a seal. Yeah, that, and so that's where he got it from. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Thank you. It was wonderful. I see all of your comments. Thank you, everyone. Any any other comments or, or questions, please? Okay. So we'll see you next week, everyone. Thank you for attending, and I hope you have enjoyed today's class. Thank you Thank so you. very much. Thank Another you. great lecture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.